All right, I think it's about time for us to get started. So uh, good morning. Um, today, uh, so that was stray a bit away from uh, the, um, the original planning. We'll continue with the slides that we uh, left off yesterday morning. Um, the, the slides that I have in the course pack for this morning, tomorrow, uh, as well as the last document on, uh, on Friday morning, uh, we'll, we'll kind of merge that into uh, what we'll do tomorrow morning. Uh, the, 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 there's uh, significantly uh, fewer slides in comparison, so it will be uh, faster to go through. Uh, th so the topic tomorrow morning will be more focused on phenomenology of liquid gas flows, or at least some aspects of phenomenology of liquid gas flows, um, some modeling aspects, and then some discussion of the uh, physics of atomization. And then what we'll finish up with on Friday will be like we did uh, last time, uh, last week for particulate inflows, will be more of a research focused uh, or current research focused discussion okay, that will be focusing on liquid gas flows. Um, so before we do that, uh, what else do we have to talk about? Well, we talked only about a couple of different methods uh, yesterday, so we'll add another couple of methods to our list and a number of variants of those methods. Um, and that, so that's my plan for, for today and the, well, for this morning. This afternoon we will uh, essentially wrap up our level set based flow solver by adding uh, the full coupling with the flow solver, which is something that at this point we've, uh, we've ignored. So uh, we'll spend time on the uh, underlying equations that will allow us to, to resolve the, uh, the, the Navier-Stokes equation in the presence of, the, of this discontinuous density and also uh, in the presence of the uh, singular surface tension force. Uh, on tomorrow afternoon, we'll kind of go through the similar process, but this time with the um, with a volume of fluid solver. So this way, the two main fundamentally Eulean-based methods for uh, capturing an interface on the mesh will have covered. So we'll spend less time on volume of, volume of uh, fluid. Uh, the main reason for that being that it is probably a more technical implementation, but it has fewer steps involved in a sense. So we'll be able to go uh, through faster with the assumption that we have enough uh, computational tools available to, uh, to ourselves. And uh, instead of starting completely from scratch, this is where I'll cheat um, uh, most, uh, the most compared to this entire uh, uh, course. I'll essentially provide, provide you with a routine that handles pretty much all of the computational geometry needs that we have, uh, because it would take a while to redevelop from scratch. Uh, and then the last uh, example, uh, for what will be, I think, a pretty short demo style uh, uh, on a, a short demo on Friday afternoon will be on atomization. So we'll use both our level set and our VOF code uh, to look at the breakup of a liquid. In 2D, so it won't be the most, uh, uh, the most realistic, but you'll see that we can uh, observe topology changes and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Okay, any questions before we start? So last time we left off with uh, Marco Particle, so the, the, this, uh, uh, we had a pretty long discussion on all the tools and the aspects needed to get a surface mesh type of approach to work. The upshot is it works well and you can do some very good science with it. Uh, but also, it's important to realize that the accuracy gain that you obtain by going to a, a Lagrangian perspective, so really this brute force, let's smash our surface and move it in a Lagrangian way, uh, that gives you good accuracy, but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, um, this accuracy is degraded by the fact that you have to manually come in in order to remove subgrid features that, uh, that are essentially meaningless. Uh, in order to also come in and reintroduce topology changes if necessary. Uh, and then basically anything regarding the cleaning up of that surface mesh that needs to happen constantly. Well, if you have a flow problem where not too much of that happens, 
where the flow is simple enough or clean enough that uh, you don't need to come in and manually fix your interface too often. Then really you'll benefit the most from the high accuracy Lagrangian transports of your surface. Uh, in situations where the flow is highly turbulent and complicated and that, uh, where you introduce a lot of corrugations on your interface, you will distort your surface mesh heavily and you'll have to come and fix it manually very often. And that will come and degrade your solution uh, and, and, and counter, uh, counteract some of these uh, uh, benefits from having um, Lagrangian tracking of your surface. So it's not, you know, like pretty much everything uh, in, in uh, CFD, th there's trade-offs. And depending on the type of flow, it might be a good method, it might not be. Uh, so let's switch now to volume of fluid method. So again, the, the main implementation for this will be tomorrow afternoon. But uh, in the meantime, let's introduce the concept uh, and let's talk about how it's been looked at over the years. So th the perspective now is going to shift quite a bit. Instead of thinking about the surface mesh, like for the marker particles, uh, instead of thinking about the level set, like we've been discussing, uh, so instead of thinking about a topographical altitude map um, like we've discussed yesterday and the day before. Uh, we're now going to be interested in tracking a quantity that I wrote here as uh, psi. This psi is going to be the amount of liquid that we have locally. So this, is, uh, this thing here is going to be the volume of liquid in the cell over the volume of the cell. Okay, conceptually it's an easy enough idea that will allow us to track uh, our liquid in, in an accurate way. So conceptually, or I guess concretely, if I have a mesh here and I know that my liquid gas interface is this red line here, what I'm saying is that cell I know it to be 100% liquid, therefore my ratio of liquid volume to cell volume is one. That cell is 100% gas, therefore the liquid volume fraction there is zero. In between, well, I'm going to have some value between 0 and 1. Okay, so this is a simple enough concept. The question is, uh, well, the first question is, what is the equation obeyed by this? And here, uh, this is not a particularly complicated task to find that the appropriate equation for this is the, um, is the same material transport equation that we had before. So our interface is moving at velocity u, therefore, we have the same material transport that controls the displacement of that, uh, of that volume fraction. So we have, again, the solution of a purely hyperbolic problem uh, that, that we have to deal with. In comparison with the level set, our level set, we argued, we wanted to define it with as smooth a profile as possible, you know, basically unity gradient. Now this is very much the exact opposite. We have essentially as sharp of a, of a profile across the interface for our psi function as you can imagine. It's essentially a discontinuous function on the scale of the mesh. So with the, transporting a numerical heavy side using a, a purely hyperbolic, a, a linear hyperbolic equation. So we're going to be facing the same type of issues that we're, that we're facing with the level set. With the level set, we said we need some upwind bias or else we're going to see oscillations. Well, the same is going to be true here. If you use a standard transport scheme, you're going to have, in particular if it's high order accuracy, you're going to have oscillations. You're going to have dispersive errors that will take the form of oscillations. Oscillations for a representation like this are problematic because now if I go above one, that means I have more than 100% uh, liquid volume in my cell, if I go below zero, I have, I have less than 0% liquid in my cell, both of, the, of which are problematic, meaningless uh, uh, statements that need to be corrected, and so that's, that, that's going to be tricky. So we have to move away from reasonably standard schemes. So you could say, well, okay, let's introduce a sufficient amount of upwind bias and, um, and guarantee, for example, a non-oscillatory and essentially non-oscillatory behavior by using an ENO scheme. Fine, but let's think a bit about what this means. If I introduce an Eno or Wino, well, let's think first about the best scheme. How about we look at the Wino? The Wino is a linear or nonlinear, sorry, combination of Eno schemes. From what we talked about yesterday, it should be clear that in that region where I have only ones, my profile is very smooth. I have, therefore, uh, my Wino scheme will collapse to the highest order accuracy possible. 
but there's no transport here. You know, transporting with divergence free field a unity value leads to no change in my values. Same way in the zero uh, region, transporting zero with any velocity field will lead to a zero result. So the fact that I have a high accuracy here and there is meaningless to me. The we know, uh, however, at the interface will detect that I have a strongly discontinuous function and that therefore I, sh I should switch back to the most appropriate Eno representation. So we know essentially for this will get me back exactly my Eno discretization. I'll gain nothing. And now concretely Eno will tell me that I will systematically use the smoothest possible stencil, but I will still have my stencil uh, go across that, uh, that, um, that rapid variation in the, in the volume uh, 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 fraction of liquid. So that's not necessarily solving any problem. And the other issue is that my Eno scheme, by definition, the reason why it doesn't oscillate much is because it uses numerical diffusion. Okay, this so twin bias leads to numerical diffusion. So what happens if I put numerical diffusion on that? On my profile, my very rapidly varying uh, numerical heavy side profile will spread over several cells. If I spread it over several cells, what essentially happens is I end up mixing my liquid and my gas together. So imagine if that cell that is currently 1 were to become, say, 0.8, and that cell was to become 0.9. That means that for some reason I have some little chunks of gas that have entered into my liquid and vice versa. That is problematic and certainly inconsistent with this idea of maintaining a sharp interface. So standard transport, it's not going to work. And that's why we're going to have essentially two uh, types of methods. One that we'll talk about, I think, a bit uh, this afternoon. Uh, and that will rely on some sort of artificial compression in order to say, yes, OK, I'll allow some mixing, but I'll control the amount of, uh, of that mixing. And so that will take us to artificial compression schemes. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk about one example of that later today, and I think another one this afternoon. Uh, the alternative, which is kind of the, 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 uh, the, the, the main workhorse for VOF schemes, is to say, well, let us uh, figure out a way of transporting our uh, volume fraction that leads to absolutely no oscillation and absolutely no diffusion. That's essentially what we need. Well, the way you do this is by performing geometric transport. So instead of relying on Eulean representations, uh, you're going to switch back to a Lagrangian way of thinking and think about the geometry of an interface moving around and how that motion of the interface leads to the displacement of the, volume, uh, the liquid volume on our mesh. That's the approach we're going to take. In order to do that, the first step is to know where the interface is located. And so for this, we're going to have to first reconstruct the interface geometry. That's going to be step one. And step two, we're going to do a geometric flux calculation. That's going to be step two. Step one is not obvious. I don't know how clear it is, but if I take, if I give you this interface and tell you um, find the amount of li the, the liquid volume on, uh, in each cell given that interface, that's a reasonably simple problem. But if I give you only the volume fraction and tell you find the interface for me, well now you have a lot less information uh, available to yourself. So again, uh, some of those images have been, uh, have been essentially uh, reduced to uh, a, a blurry mess like this, so sorry about that. But really conceptually, the, the volume fraction in the cell is devoid of any information regarding the interface uh, location certainly within the cell. It would be in fact appropriate to think of this volume fraction as a, uh, an orientation agnostic little chunk of liquid floating around in our cell. So at the scale level, if I tell you 20% of, uh, of that cell is liquid, you don't know where the interface is. If you start looking now at the collection of cells sitting around one another, you can start to figure out how the interface might look like. So if I tell you 
Those three cells are 100% liquid. This is 80%, this is 60%, this is 40%, 10%, 5%. You can kind of get the picture and you can mentally at least say, well, my interface probably goes somewhere through that. And if you can eyeball it, you can probably derive a scheme that gives you, uh, that returns the interface for you. But if I give you now a, a, a distribution that looks like this, a volume fraction, at least by eyeballing it, you probably have no idea where the interface might be. So that kind of highlights the difficulty of finding the interface location from only the knowledge of the liquid volume fraction. So we'll talk about two approaches for representing the interface. And then from that, we'll talk about a number of approaches for uh, uh, in order to do the, the, the detailed calculations. And then again, tomorrow afternoon, we'll implement the second one of those approaches. So we'll start from the very beginning. Uh, and, and that very beginning is the first attempt, uh, the first published attempt that uh, at least I know of, of doing this type of geometric construction of the interface. It comes from uh, pretty old work of Noah and Woodward. And they recognized the need to represent the interface. And they did that in what is probably the simplest way you can think of, by allowing the interface in the cell to either look like a vertical line or a horizontal line. They were solving in 2D. Okay. The name of the method is slick, simple line interface calculation. And it's based on essentially a logical treatment of your local uh, volume fraction as well as the neighbor's volume fraction data. What do I mean by logical? Well, we're going to introduce, at least they introduce this concept of fluid occupation numbers. Fluid occupation number is nothing uh, uh, fancy. It is just information regarding whether there is a phase say you have phase one and phase two, um, you're going to define for phase one an occupation number of one in a cell that contains that phase one and of zero if you don't have that phase one. Okay. The approach uh, th that they proposed is based on, on a very simple set of rules. You're going to be looking either in X or in Y at your neighbors. So let's think just about X for now. If you're looking at your neighbors in X, you're going to be sitting at a cell i, and you're going to be looking at i minus 1 and i plus 1. And what you're going to be asking yourself is, do I have phase 1 in cell i minus 1? Do I have phase 1 in phase i plus 1? Do I have phase 1 in phase i? Uh, sorry, do you have phase 1 in cell i minus 1, cell i, or cell i plus 1? Okay, and then you're going to ask yourself the same question for phase 2. The idea is simple. If cell i minus 1 has phase 1, Cell I, my, uh, cell I has phase 1, but phase cell I plus 1 does not have phase 1, then they'll just say phase 1 is blue. In my cell I, I'll just have a vertical plane like this that indicates the termination of phase 1. Phase 1 existed on the left, it doesn't exist on the right, so somewhere in my cell there's a plane that says here's where it stops. Placing that plane is easy because you know the volume fraction. So it's a, it's a trivial thing. Uh, so that's one case. Of course, you can flip this and do the same thing with phase two and, uh, and make the same argument. Now, if phase one and phase uh, two both occupy the same set of cells, then that argument doesn't really hold. So if I say that I have phase one, um, so, so if in my cell I have phase 1 and phase 2, and in my neighboring cell I have either phase 1 uh, and phase 2, well, basically if I have the same distribution of fluid, the same occupation number um, for my three cells, for both fluids, then this argument doesn't really hold. I cannot easily say, well, I, my, 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 my liquid terminates at that location. In that case, you kind of give up and say, well, there's probably mostly stuff happening in the other direction. So looking at my neighbor to the left and to the right has not really allowed me to say uh, anything uh, smart about uh, the position of the liquid gas interface. So you're going to place instead a horizontal uh, interface. And then there's the other case uh, here where if you have phase one on the left 
and on the right, and you still have phase zero. Uh, so you have phase one on the left in the middle and on the right, but you also have phase zero in the middle. And then that means that you probably have a sheet of that phase that's immersed somewhere in your cell. And so then you introduce two interfaces. So it seems a bit unwieldy, but it's a, a series of fairly simple uh, uh, if statements. So uh, let me show you a concrete example here. Uh, going back to our sketch from before, we can look, for example, right here at the, um, at the occupation right here. So say on the left, so the, 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 the three numbers, the, the triplets are all for the cell on the left, my cell, the cell on the right. The, no, the triplet below is for the blue face, the triplet, the triplet above is for the white face. Okay, that's the way it's done. Well, that's the way I, I, I sketched this. So you can look at that face, for example, on the left, I don't have uh, uh, my blue phase. In the middle, I have it. On the right, I have it. Okay, that means that my phase starts somewhere and then continues from there within my cell. Therefore, I'm going to put this vertical line here when I'm, reconstructed, I'm reconstructing uh, based on the x direction. That cell, well, I have the, f the blue fluid on the left, on the right, and in the cell, but I also have the white one in all three cells. I have no discriminating information that I can uh, uh, call upon from, these, uh, from this uh, stencil. I essentially give up and place a vertical interface instead. Okay, so this is the example in X. This is doing the same thing in Y, right here. Why are we doing this in X and in Y? Well, because I'll, I'll mention that in a second, but a lot of the uh, uh, volume of fluid schemes are based on the idea of what's called uh, a split transport. So we're not going to transport all at once using the full velocity, but we're going to first do a transport step using only the X component of the velocity, and then we'll transport only in the Y direction and then only in the Z direction. So in that context, before you do your X direction transport, you would do this reconstruction in X and then move your stuff in X. Then you would do your Y reconstruction and move your uh, information in Y, okay? But anyway, this is pr probably the simplest way you can think about reconstructing uh, a, uh, an actual interface. But it should be pretty clear that it's bad. It's not, you know, it doesn't look very, uh, very good. It works in the sense that you can actually implement that. that. That gives you some position of the interface that's an actionable method. You can implement it and get results from it. But it's not giving you a particularly realistic uh, representation. So let's do something better. And that's, um, so this first paper was in uh, 76. The, the second one was another uh, 15 years afterwards, in 92 by uh, Parker and Young. This uh, paper introduces the, the next step up in, in realism in the representation of the interface. And that's to say, well, so far we've looked at either an interface like this or like this. Well, let's at least allow it to be oriented in some optimal way. So we're going to stick to a planar representation, but we're going to free up its direction to be anything that we find to be appropriate. All right, so this is, imagine this is my cell, this A, B, C, D here. Now I'm going to be representing my interface with some inclined plane. The method is called PLIC, piecewise linear interface calculation. Uh, why piecewise? Well, because from cell to cell, you're going to have a different linear interface uh, reconstruction. And so that gives you a piecewise construction. Um, what are the ingredients in this? Well, I need to write a plane equation to represent this plane. In 2D, that plane equation would look like this. So some uh, um, normal dotted with the position is equal to some displacement of my, uh, of my plane, okay? What are the constraints? Well, if I know the orientation of my, uh, of my interface, then the constraint is not too complicated to, 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 to imagine. My constraint is that the volume under my plane, but inside my cell, has to match with my liquid volume as given from my, from my volume fraction, okay? So here, 
we're working with the assumption that we know the liquid volume fraction, we're interested in reconstructing the interface. So if in that cell I know what is the fraction of the cell that's in the liquid, and if I tell you that I know already the orientation of the plane, right, this uh, m vector here given by mx, my, if I know the orientation of the plane, then the question is where should I place this plane for the volume, or I guess in 2D, the area under this plane to be equal to the one predicted by the volume fraction. Well, that's something you can write reasonably uh, 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 easily. Uh, you need heavy sites in order to deal with those, uh, those, those uh, 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 boundaries, but they're essentially intersecting a square with a, with a, with a, a plane, or basically you're, you're computing the intersection between a square and a triangle, if you want to think about this. You can write this out. It's not too, too difficult. In 2D, that takes the form of that equation. So that's the amount of liquid volume fraction expressed analytically in terms of the position of my plane, in terms of the height of the cell, or the, the size of the cell, and in terms of MX and MY, the orientation of my plane. So this is all analytical. We can, we can do this. Um, the 3D. So the 2D is very easy to digest. The 3D expression is still analytical, but more unwieldy. And um, ultimately, what we want is not that information. What we want is, given this, I want to know what alpha is. Okay, So I need the inverse of this. Uh, there are also analytical expressions. You can obtain analytically the inverse of this, so you can obtain alpha, the position of the plane, as a function of the volume fraction. So that makes it reasonably, um, so let's say we need alpha from a psi volume fraction. So we'll talk specifically about how to do this uh, tomorrow afternoon, and we'll actually implement that. Uh, so. What am I missing? Okay. Oh, yeah. So now the, the uh, orientation. So we did all this with the assumption that the orientation is known. In general, of course, the orientation is not known. However, uh, been, there are a number of fairly easy ways to obtain an estimate of the orientation. In fact, if you had a perfect heavy side function of the interface, taking its gradient would give you the normal orientation to the interface times a direct function of the interface position. So analytically, in the perfect world, you would have directly by taking the gradient of your volume fraction, you would have your normal vector. Concretely, this function is discontinuous. It is not a practical function for us to differentiate. So it is tricky for us to compute the gradient. However, um, there are a number of methods out there. Uh, I'll give you one example, and we'll talk about another example in a, a few slides. Uh, the method of Lee. Is, uh, is, uh, is an option. It recognizes the fact that you cannot simply do a direct centered derivative of your uh, volume fraction data because it is discontinuous, but it does the following thing. If you have an, an ensemble of four cells, it goes after the calculation of the gradient based on a very compact stencil right at the cell vertex right here. So if I have cell ij, i plus 1j, uh, ij plus 1, and i plus 1, j plus 1, it computes at this corner vertex the gradient using center derivatives. It's not necessarily going to give a very good result, but for a given cell, by using this, I'll actually have four estimates of my gradient at the four uh, vertices, which I can then bring back through averaging to the cell center. And that will alleviate some of the inaccuracies associated with, uh, with, the, uh, with the fact that we're trying to differentiate in this continuous function. 
The other method that we'll talk about, uh, that, that I mentioned briefly in a little while, it takes a more brute force approach to this. It says, well, this volume fraction, the reason why we can't differentiate it easily is because it is discontinuous. If I were to, to smooth it, it would be less discontinuous and it would be more amenable to differentiation. And so let's first filter the volume fraction and then, and then let us differentiate it. That should give us some estimate of the, uh, of, the, um, of the gradient. And so that's the method that we'll actually use tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so now we have, uh, and I should add to this that there's many others for estimating the normal vector from Psi, and we'll talk about uh, several of them um, tomorrow afternoon. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? So let's look at this. Now, the first step is to estimate your, um, your gradient. You can only do that in a few cells. There's many cells where you can't possibly obtain a meaningful gradient. But if you can obtain a meaningful gradient, probably you're going to be at the interface itself where you need to do the, the split reconstruction. Once you have the interface, you can inverse this relation between the position of the plane and the, uh, and the volume fraction. And that will be, give you your piecewise linear reconstruction of this uh, interface. It is not perfect, but it is significantly better visually than what we looked at uh, with the slick approach. Okay, so once we have this, what do we do with this? Well, we need to use this geometric reconstructed interface, right? So now we know what the interface is in a way that's consistent with the amount of volume that we have in each cell. Now we need to transport this. Well, we said that we can't use normal transport schemes. And so what we're going to do instead is inherently we're going to make use of a Lagrangian perspective. So first of all, I'll say explicitly that we'll make use of directional operator splitting, which means that we'll not do transport in the form of a one-step convection treatment, but we'll do three transport steps. First, a transport step in X only, while leaving the, uh, while setting the velocity in the, in the y and z components to zero, then a transport step in y only while setting the, the x and z component of the velocity to zero, and then in z only. So we're going to do x transport y transport followed by z transport. If you know the velocity, so now let's think only about x transport. If you know the u velocity, which you do, it's obtained from the flow solver velocity, uh, from the, 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 the yeah from the, the 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 from your flow solver, then you can manually take the segment that you've created, this this uh, this uh, line that you've constructed. You can manually take this and it vect it at that u velocity that you know. You can in fact generate a, uh, you can take a linear reconstruction of, of your velocity from cell to cell. So you can use second order accuracy to represent your velocity and then you can perform a, an advection from left to right, right to left of your interface at exactly the u velocity. So that looks like this, if in cell A, B, C, D, at time n, I have an interface that I've reconstructed to look like this. I can look at this x transport. This x transport is happening from my cell phase velocities. If you're in a staggered framework, you have a velocity at that phase and you have a velocity at that phase. They're not the same velocities, but you can assume that, you linear, that that velocity linearly varies from that phase velocity to that phase velocity. And so you're going to take that cell 
and it vectored according to that velocity. Okay, so you're going to do two things. You're going to translate that cell. And you're going to also allow for stretching of that cell since the velocity on both phases, on both faces, is not the same. So, for example, if the velocity of that face is larger, this is going to move further to the right. If the velocity of that face is less, this is going to move less to the right. Okay. So. Nothing too complicated here. In the process, you're stretching and, and re, uh, 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 you're deforming this plane. But computing the deformation of this plane given a linear velocity field is not complicated. And from that, you can say that within the course of one time step, the x uh, direction flow has made this cell give to its neighbor to the right an amount of liquid that exactly corresponds to what's grayed out here. Okay? Everything that's been stretched and translated uh, such that it ends up in now my cell A, G, H, B, that's really stuff that's been, that's liquid volume that's been fluxed from left to right. Okay? So this is, this is based on a, on a very uh, uh, Lagrangian perspective. We're not now taking our cell as a fixed object. We're saying our cell is actually moving at the flow velocity. And in the process of moving at the flow velocity, uh, it, it, uh, it transports its quantity to the neighboring cells. And from that, we can back calculate what the flux is. And that flux here, again, is just that amount of liquid volume that needs to be transported through that phase during our time step. OK? Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on this? So this you can compute easily. Uh, this is uh, inherently what you would refer to as a semi-Lagrangian perspective. It takes the underlying mesh, but then it moves the mesh in order to figure out fluxes. Um, OK, it's very plane of velocity by linearly interpolating velocities in each cell. Calculate change in liquid volume uh, in cell and neighbors. The, th there's an interesting restriction here. Um, you cannot do that at any speed you want. The reason for this is that if you allow for your CFL to be too large, you could end up with that plane here. So the position of your left face at time n plus 1 could catch up and overtake the position of the plane here at time n plus 1. So you have velocity, you have one velocity here and one larger velocity here. So this is, you're using the phase velocities to do this. the phase velocities Yes. So you, you take a, a linear uh, uh, velocity, uh, 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 or linear velocity distribution between those two velocities. Okay. So, worst case scenario, imagine you're running at CFL1, but imagine that your velocity field is fluctuating and oscillating from its maximum to its minimum. So imagine I have a large velocity from left to right here and a large velocity from right to left here. In that situation, you would create a negative cell volume at the next time, uh, which would kill this method. If you limit your CFL by 0.5, then worst case scenario, this guy will move to half the domain, and this guy will move to half the domain, and you, you'll, be, uh, you'll still be safe. Okay. So the stability of this approach requires a low enough uh, uh, CFL. We'll see how we can alleviate those things, uh, those limitations uh, as we move forward. So this is x. You do that in y, then you do that in z. So the process is the following. You reconstruct the interface using the split algorithm. Okay. Then you do your X transport, which we just showed here. That allows you to update the amount of liquid in each cell after the X transport. That also invalidates your reconstruction. That means that now your plick, you can throw it out. So you perform a plick again to obtain your new interface position in that cell. Then you do the Y transport. That updates your volume fraction, 
You can throw out your, your plic reconstruction again, so you have to regenerate this uh, planar reconstruction of the interface, and then you do your Z-transport. Now you've done X, Y, Z, you can do one last plic reconstruction, and you're done for the time step. Okay, so some high-level comments on this. Slick will show, um, and, and, and Plick as well, uh, will, will suffer from what's called jetsums and flotsums. Let me show you one example, or maybe I can use this, since I don't have a lot of room on this slide. I can show you an example of how this method can fail pretty easily. If because of numerical errors, so let's say your interface looks like this, 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 uh, yeah, fine. I remember it's discontinuous, so the, the, we don't have to match perfectly. If because of numerical, of numerical errors, I don't predict my normal in that cell to look like this, but instead I predict it to look like this, what will happen to my, uh, to my plate reconstruction? It will automatically flip to the other side. So you can see that inaccuracies in, of any sort, basically, with our reconstruction will have as a main consequence this spurious transport that happens on the scale of approximately the mesh size. So here we've just moved a chunk of liquid, effectively in our reconstruction, by approximately delta x. It's not a small error. In fact, we've just said that we want to limit our transport uh, at a CFL of 0.5. So that means this is at least two time step size worth of max CFL transport. So this is not a small thing. This is a pretty major uh, error that we're making. Once you make this error, this little chunk of stuff can continue transporting on its own. And so you'll have this tendency with uh, volume of fluid methods based on either slick or plick, more so with slick, which uh, leads to more erroneous reconstructions. You'll have this tendency to have detached little pieces of chunk, uh, little chunks of, uh, of, of liquids or gas similarly, that detach from the main uh, uh, um, interface and start traveling on their own. So, Maybe you can turn back off the, the lights so that we can see the slides better. Um, the, um, so that's what we would refer to as a jetsam or flotsam. So there's uh, those ideas of little chunks of stuff that have been detached and are now floating around. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. If you're not careful with the way you do your transport, well, the fact is that transporting in X only is not a divergence-free step. Obviously, the x component of the velocity is not a divergence-free velocity. And so as you transport, you will potentially be creating overshoots or undershoots. So the x, y plus z transport, it has no guarantee, the way we've described it, to maintain this boundedness of the volume fraction between 0 and 1. So that's an issue. Um, in the same way, if, you're not very, if your scheme is not perfectly uh, uh, capable of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of giving you a divergence-free transport, then even transporting zero volume of liquid in the divergence-free field, if the, div if the velocity field is complex enough, could lead to spontaneous creation of liquid, uh, of liquid mass or liquid volume. Alternatively, the other way around, you could have little chunks of gas showing up within the liquid, uh, liquid field. So this is what's typically referred to as wisps. Uh, those are small, erroneous volume fractions that show up in regions where they have no reason to be. And that, again, comes from the fact that our transport is based on the Somatagrangian uh, split XYZ transport that doesn't match with the fundamental underlying divergence-free condition 
that we use to build our, our flow solver in the first place. And the question is, how do you deal with this? Right? If your solver has predicted that you should have a little chunk of stuff that flows up somewhere, well, it's difficult to argue that you can just remove it, or else you're not conservative. Uh, so it's problematic. In the same way, it is difficult to deal with values uh, larger than 1 or less than 0. You have to somehow massage them into fitting in other cells around it. That's called redistribution uh, uh, methods. Doing what we just talked about for normal interface motion is a little tricky. So if you want to do evaporation with VARF, you have to be, uh, you have to be a little bit careful, but that's feasible. Um, and then, yeah, a few comments on, uh, um, on what else can you do? What, what, what are improvements? Well, people have proposed to go away from the simple planar reconstruction of the interface and go to a, parabol to a full parabolic representation of the interface. This is the so-called uh, Prost method. So uh, that stands for par uh, parabolic reconstruction of surface tension. Um, this is the next step up in complexity. But it's an enormous step up in complexity. And in fact, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's very difficult to do transport that's compatible with this reconstruction. So yes, they go parabolic in their approach, but they use that only to improve the calculation of curvature. They don't actually make use of that for transport. They, stick, they, they, they still stick to a, 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 pla a planar reconstruction for transport. Um, and the second issue is that every time you try to go high order, you're going to have a solution that's prone to oscillatory behaviors. And in fact, every time you're going to start to go to very small scale uh, interface uh, corrugations or two interfaces getting close to one another, this PROS method tends to become, uh, let's say, uh, it, it does not work nearly as well. It becomes unstable. People have worked on fixing a lot of those areas, uh, a lot of these, uh, those specific areas, so making sure that you can uh, figure out how to transport your, uh, your volume of uh, fluid in a way that never generates overshoots or undershoots, and that is exactly conservative. So that's an example of that. There's, there's more examples uh, uh, of this. We'll talk tomorrow about a specific class of method that I'm not going to talk more about uh, right here. And that's unsplit methods, uh, methods that forego completely this x followed by y followed by z transport, and instead take this summa Lagrangian perspective for the full cell. So instead of just looking at the transport of our cell from the perspective of just 1D shifts, we're going to take the full cell. And we're going to move it backwards in time and we're going to go look at the amount of liquid we had there. So this unsplit transport idea uh, is ultimately what we're going to implement tomorrow. Any questions on this? OK, so we've talked about transport. Uh, we've talked about reconstruction. Now the coupling with the flow solver, well, there's not too much that needs to be said. Um, we have already volume fractions, so we can easily set our fluid properties based on simply integrating our density over both phases. If the density is constant, this is exact. Uh, the volume, fr the, um, the, 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 um, the viscosity is uh, a bit more tricky. This is one possibility. We mentioned that we can do harmonic averaging as well. But this is more of a model at this point. Uh, surface tension, well, surface tension requires information that's tied to the presence of the interface. So we need to estimate, if you remember, we ended up writing uh, our sigma kappa times a Dirac function at the interface for our surface tension term. Well, that's fine. We can, we can do that. And in fact, we have a quantity right now that's built to essentially emulate a heavy side uh, function of the interface. Well, the Dirac function is just a derivative of the Heaviside function. So that kind of takes us back to the idea that maybe we just want to take the gradient of that um, volume fraction. The gradient of the, of the volume fraction should be a pretty darn good way of identifying pretty precisely the location of the interface. Uh, 
This is the so-called continuum surface force approach, this idea of using this quantity of Bragg Bielodal. And we'll talk in a second about how this is calculated. Alternatively, you can say that the, uh, the, uh, the surface tension really comes from not a, well, the fact that we have a surface tension force comes from the fact that we've taken the surface divergence of a surface stress, right? Again, this is the, this duality between, if you look at a, a control volume that contains some surface, really surface tension pulls on all sides of the edge of this, uh, of this surface. Once I integrate all this, I get a net normal force. So either we, integrate, we, uh, we introduce directly this normal force, or we could discretize instead the stress sensor from which this force uh, arises. And so that's uh, what I wrote here. The surface tension uh, 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 term, you can also write it as a divergence of a surface stress in the following way. Here, when we write this, uh, the surface stress, there's normal vectors showing up. Those normal vectors, we can again relate them to gradients of the uh, volume fraction. Okay, the normal vector is just the gradient of the volume fraction divided by the magnitude of the gradient of the volume fraction. Uh, and, and so we get directly what we want by just manipulating the gradient of the volume fraction. So, there's really the, the, those two approaches. If you have the volume fraction, if you have a heavy side, then computing the gradient of that heavy side can give you access to a normal vector, which can be used to generate uh, surface stress, or it can be used uh, uh, to generate a, um, a curvature and then be used in uh, the calculation of a surface force. So CSS, uh, versus uh, uh, CSF is really what we're talking about here. In both cases, you need some... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Is there any difference in the CSF and CSF? Yeah, so really the term you're discretizing is not the same. In one case, you discretize this. So you actually form a surface stress. So you don't ever compute the curvature directly. You compute the, uh, the, 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 the surface tension stress acting on the, on the edge of your, of your interface and your control volume, and then you take the divergence of that. So yeah, the, in one case, you, you build the stress from the uh, volume of fluid. In the other case, you build directly the force from the volume of fluid. Is there uh, any advantage for this? <laughs> so the idea is that, so, so in, you know, in, in the perfect world, if everything is uh, analytical, then those things are the same, right? Yeah. But, but obviously, this is not the case, because this is not a true heavy side. If this was a true heavy side, then the answer to the first question you asked would be, yes, those are the same. Analytically, you derive one from the other, they're equivalent. The question is, where is it better to come in and say, well, really, my heavy side is this numerical heavy side. It has a certain thickness. It is my volume of fluid uh, and not a true heavy side. So that introduces errors. The question is, is it better to introduce that error when you're computing the surface stress? Or is it better to go all the way to, this, to the force? Why would there be differences? Well, the argument would be that in one case you introduce this, uh, this smoother uh, uh, um, field in order to calculate the normal only. So you take lower order derivatives really of it. And then you rely on the, this, this, uh, this exp so in, either you differentiate the stress, uh, either you estimate the stress with this error and then you argue that you just need the divergence of that, or you just carry out the differentiation uh, on paper and then you discretize the results. Um, you, know, the, you decide where you put the smearing, basically. They don't behave in ways that are not necessarily different, but the continuum surface stress is more complex to implement because you, ne you need to build a full stress term. Uh, again, so that's one of those images that uh, didn't survive the uh, aging of PowerPoint. So 
the approach used by, uh, by people, the typical approach is to say that it's difficult to compute the normal from a volume fraction. We've, we've said that already. So the first step is to smear out or smooth this volume fraction, spread it out so that it is resolvable on our mesh, and then we can compute the gradient of it. Then we can use essentially simple central differencing on the smooth function, and now we have some estimate of the normal. We're done for, continuous, for the continuous surface stress, uh, stress approach. We can just write out the stress, and then we'll compute the divergence of that stress, and this is it. For the continuous uh, surface uh, force, we'll need to keep going. Once we have our normal vector, we'll compute our uh, divergence of the normal to get the curvature. And then uh, we'll multiply that by the gradient of uh, our smooth uh, psi. Uh, and that will give us a, a, our um, surface tension force. So this was supposed to be some convergence test uh, coming from a paper of, uh, by Francois Dahl uh, back in 2006, which was highlighting the fact that this is not that easy to do in general. Uh, first of all, if you choose very carefully the way you smear out, you smooth your, your um, volume fraction, you can get, with a method like that, you can get some convergence, but typically you'll observe first order convergence. So this here, the squares, correspond to the CSF method with smoothing done on a scale of about two times the mesh size. Uh, so this is the first order line, and this is the second order line, and this was the method that, um, uh, this is an, alter an alternative method called the height function method that we'll talk about right now. Okay, so those approaches, they tend to be, they observe to be at best with a lot of care put in first order only. How do you do better than this? Well, you do better than this by potentially trying to get rid in any way of the discontinuity. It is not a good idea to try to differentiate across any type of, different, uh, of discontinuity. Getting the normal by taking the gradient of supply is never going to be a good, uh, a good strategy. So taking twice, uh, you know, taking a second order derivative is even worse. This so-called height function method alleviates this by observing that you can simply integrate in space in order to remove this discontinuity. So imagine I take my uh, volume fraction field over a column of cells. Say I have here in that cell a value of 1, here a value of 1, here a value of 0.6, and here a value of 0 and 0 and 0. So I have a column that cuts the interface. This volume fraction field is discontinuous. Differentiating, differentiating it is not a practical thing to do. But if I integrate over this vertical position, what I transform this into is simply a measure of the height of my liquid column. Okay? So by integrating vertically, I transform this discontinuous function of the y position into a single number that tells me how high of an interface I have locally. Well, imagine I do this now on a 3x3 three three stencil. So I'm interested in computing the curvature, say, right here. Yes, I'd like to keep my... What is going on here? Okay. So I'm sitting at cell IJ. I integrate from a few cells below to a few cells above. Say I have liquid below, gas above. I have one piece of information, which is how high my column of liquid in that cell IJ region uh, is. And then I go to the neighboring region, I minus 1, J, and I do the same thing. And I'll know how high my liquid goes in that vertical column. And so if I do that in this entire region, I have now a 3x3 three three, uh, local stencil of a quantity that's not discontinuous anymore. The quantity is now, in fact, completely continuous. It's just a piece of information uh, that tells me how high my liquid goes locally. Well, that I can use now to differentiate. 
height information is not discontinuous information. I can freely, uh, confidently discretize that. So if I go back to my definition of the, um, of the curvature calculation, uh, remember, I need to compute the normal and then the, grade, the, the uh, divergence of that normal. Uh, we wrote that, I think, quickly yesterday. In full 3D, this is how this looks. Where it, here, H is, as a function of space, the height of liquid. Okay. That requires a 3x3 three three stencil, but it also requires, in the third dimension, an integration over an entire column that extends below and above. It is absolutely required that that column extends all the way to a full liquid cell and all the way up to a full gas cell. If you cannot read full liquid on one side and full gas on the other side, doesn't matter which side that is, you're not going to have a true height. You're going to have some information that is some integral that will still, that will not have integrated over the entire continuity. And so that means that you're going to have to have a pretty wide stencil in that integration direction. Typically seven cells is kind of the bare minimum that gives you your own cell plus three cells below, three cells above. So you can see that we're talking about pretty large stencils here. But also, so that assumes that, of course, for this to make any sense, we need to have an interface in this case that's more or less oriented in that direction. If my interface was in oriented like this, no amount of vertical integration would take me from full liquid to full gas. And so if your interface is instead oriented like this, you would want to go to a width information. You would integrate from left to right, so you would switch your stencil orientation to always systematically ensure that you can find full liquid on one side, full gas on the other. If you can guarantee that, if you can build a local stencil that will integrate away through the discontinuity, you have now a, you know, if your transport scheme is second order accurate, you'll have a second order estimate of the, uh, of the height, um, and, and you'll be able to form converging estimates of the curvature. And in fact, an expression like that so I'll say it here, if uh, the stencil can be defined, then it is second order accurate. What do I mean by if the stencil can be defined? Well, what I mean is this simple situation here. What if my interface looks like this? That's not crazy. That's a reasonable interface shape. Can I define a height in, the, in that region? The answer is no, I cannot define a height. I can define the width, however, right? I can go from full liquid to full gas, full liquid, full gas, full liquid, full gas. So right here, I can, in 2D, generate an ensemble of three points. That means I can locally estimate the curvature. I can do the same thing right here. Uh, so centered on that cell, I can form a full gas, full liquid, full gas, full liquid, full gas, full liquid. So here I can compute three heights, no problem. How about that cell now? If I'm on that corner cell where the orientation of the interface is 45 degrees, approximately. I cannot define a height on my right, nor can I define a width above. So there you can start to see the problem and the limitation of a height function type of, type of idea. The problem being you're essentially adjusting your stencil based on the way the interface intersects your mesh. Well, there's cases where you cannot find a stencil. 
in that case, the height function will not work. And in fact, by not work, it will not be able to generate any reasonable answer for you. So when it works, it's good. When it doesn't work, well, tough luck. This is still, I don't want to make it sound like this is, uh, uh, I'm not dissing on the method. This is probably the best method out there uh, for volume of fluid methods. It's just not a finished story. Uh, one of my students published a few years back a method that looks at integrating over inclined directions like this in order to reintroduce some sort of, uh, of a curvature estimate. And so, and, and there's papers uh, trying to move forward, uh, to move this method forward are uh, coming out in the Journal of Computational Physics regularly um, every, every year for the past few years. So this is heavy work in progress. This is not a solved problem. So in general, curvature from volume of fluid is a tricky exercise. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? Okay. A few more comments. Uh, we've been commenting on whether the method can provide uh, a handling for topology changes. Well, the way our click interface reconstruction works will automatically reorient the interface whenever two chunks of VOF come close to one another. So automatically, because of the underlying limitation in our resolution based on the mesh, uh, we will find that top topology changes are automatically uh, handled. It's good and bad. Remember, I tried to contrast that. It is good because you don't have to come in and manually do something. It is bad because essentially you're saying, well, my model for the, for the physics of topology changes is essentially lack of mesh resolution. This is not a good model, but at least the cost is essentially zero. So, something to think about. If you have uh, been able to uh, uh, derive a scheme that's exactly conservative for the psi quantity, then automatically the consequence is you conserve the liquid volume and the gas volume if the flow is incompressible, meaning the properties of the scheme uh, are, are particularly good in terms of, uh, of preserving the uh, of preserving the, the first uh, the um, the primary conservation uh, property. Again, the the topology change, the scale of topology change, is controlled by the grid size. The grid size, and there's one last comment that uh, goes takes us back to this idea of wisps and uh, and uh, float sams and jet sams. It is problematic in general to transport a structure of small size. So once I create something like this, what we just showed is that the plick algorithm itself can misplace this chunk here and place it on the other side of the cell. And we argue that this corresponds effectively to typically two full time steps at the maximum CFL. That means that plick, through the errors it can make, effectively can work harder than the transport scheme. We move stuff at a rate of about half a cell per time step at most, while Plick has the capability of moving stuff by a full, st a full step per reconstruction. If Plick is inaccurate, Plick might overtake transport. So what that means is if you're in a situation where you have little pieces of, uh, of detached liquid volume or gas volume, again, this is symmetric, uh, the reconstruction errors will completely dominate the transport. And you might, in fact, be in situations where tiny structures are moved forward through the transport algorithm, but placed back on the left side of the cell through the reconstruction, which means that you've, you've effectively anchored your liquid volume to a cell and you're unable to detach it from it. So even though we're potentially here working with conservative methods, some fraction of the mass that you're transporting is being inaccurately transported. Okay, so the level set method doesn't suffer from that. The level set method will transport accurately. Anything it transport will be transported fairly accurately. Um, however, you have this no control over the uh, over the uh, the volume being transported so conservation errors will happen 
So I have a few examples and then we'll, we'll ramp up the uh, volume of fluid. Uh, the main example here is, uh, takes us back to some of the stuff we saw. So we'll, we'll talk more about that tomorrow afternoon so I don't want to spend too much time. I was pointing out uh, the existence of those jet sums and flood sums. This is my initial condition uh, uh, VAR field for Zelizac disk test problem, which you know everything about at this point. Look at all these little, little chunks of stuff. Those are those jet sums and flood sums, those little detached regions that are moving on their own due to erroneous uh, uh, reconstructions. The piecewise in, uh, linear interface construction does a significantly better job. And here, in fact, with this vis visualization, you don't see any uh, jet sum and flood sum. If you were to truly pl plot uh, here the, um, the uh, uh, plick interface, you would probably see some, but they are, they've been mostly removed by going to a better reconstruction. The second test case is the deformation test case. It's uh, so-called in, in the vortex field that we looked at yesterday. Uh, same story as you stretch this, you detach little chunks everywhere with slick. With plick, things look quite a bit better. Uh, we'll go back to that tomorrow afternoon as we uh, play with our own uh, VAF implementation. But because you have now a volume conserving method, once you go to the tail end of this, uh, of this serpentine uh, shape, once it falls below resolution, well, the level set method just lost this thin structure. It didn't have the resolution to support it. However, the plick method cannot lose it because losing this stuff would, be, would mean not being conservative. But here we're solving conservatively for the volume fraction. Um, so that means this stuff needs to, say, needs to stay. Well, what we see is essentially the method then becomes overtaken by numerical surface tension, if you will. Things will detach because the reconstruction will start flipping, flipping orientations. As soon as my ligament becomes thin enough, my plick reconstruction will not be able to provide me with two plick surfaces within the same cell, and the plick will switch to a, a, uh, to a, a perpendicular uh, orientation which will mean that the structure will detach and will leave behind a little drop. Okay, so this is, uh, this is how you can achieve mass conservation in the absence of sufficient resolution. So some summary of this. Uh, so this method is like the level set method, gonna give us a capturing of the uh, interface. However, the interface in the level set method is pretty explicit. It's an isosurface that's easy to obtain. Here, it is not easy to obtain because it comes from an integration relation. So it's not by figuring out where the g is equal to zero uh, um, is that you find the interface. It's by finding a plane that integrates to the value that you've been transporting. So this implicit representation makes it difficult to reconstruct the geometry. However, you can achieve very excellent volume conservation. In fact, more modern methods, in particular unsplit methods that we'll talk about tomorrow afternoon, can achieve exact uh, volume conservation. You don't have to worry about topology changes, even though, again, this is a, a major modeling assumption. We'll talk a bit about uh, the non-split approach. If you want to transport everything all at once, the complexity goes up a lot. In fact, I would, I would say this is one of the main characteristics that separate level set from VAF. Level set is simple by all uh, intents and purposes to implement. Volume of fluid is a pretty challenging, uh, a good volume of fluid scheme is difficult to implement. Uh, the main other point is that the curvature calculation remains a, a topic of, uh, of research at this point. Still, uh, volume of fluid is probably by pretty far at this point the most popular interface tracking method out there. Okay. We'll switch to level set. We've talked about level sets already, so we'll go fast. A lot of those things we've talked about, so uh, we'll just jump to the few points that, are, uh, that we didn't discuss uh, yesterday afternoon or the day before. We've talked already about the fact that the level set also has an implicit representation of the interface. It is not based on integral relations, but simple, uh, a simple isosurface statement. So our interface uh, here, those slides are based on a somewhat more uh, generic representation where I'm not hard coding everything um, 
based on the zero ISO surface. I'm saying that I'm interested in the interface represented by the G is equal to G naught ISO surface. Typically, your G naught is going to be zero. So if you have a smooth, well-behaved function, you can define directly the gradient. You'll notice here that uh, there's a minus sign. It doesn't really matter. The question is, do you want the gradient to point to the phase that's in the positive level set or in the negative level set region? It doesn't matter. Um, you can pick one or the other. Somewhat more general transport equation that this time accounts for phase change. If you have some relative velocity between the interface and the background fluid, you need to add it as an extra transport term. Uh, otherwise, the equation is just this material transport equation. If the interface recedes, it will recede at a certain velocity, and that will make it move normally. If you were to make this a full vector, this will be an sp times the normal vector dotted with grad g, because uh, the normal vector is directly related to grad g. This is a pure source term in your equation. So that's just your recession or advancement of the interface. So all this is fine at the interface. We need to generalize that to a field that we can solve on the mesh. So we need something to say away from the interface. Uh, there's many different uh, inter um, level sets, uh, kinds that's been proposed. Uh, I'll mention two here. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the second one, I think, this afternoon, I believe. Uh, but the main one we've talked about so far is this idea of a sine distance function, which is sketched here for a 2D circle. So this idea that at each point you're measuring a sine distance from the interface. So we talked about that. I'm not going to spend any time of, uh, on this. Uh, this afternoon, again, I, I believe it's this afternoon, uh, we'll be talking about, or maybe that's on Friday, I can't remember. Um, but we'll be talking about an alternative definition to our function that's written in one way here, but that will write also uh, differently. Um, the idea is, uh, is a, using a, a level set that looks like a smeared heavy side that gives rise to the idea of a conservative level set. So we'll talk about this in more details. Uh, that gives us a different shape for our function. It's not a distance anymore. It's going to be something that looks more like a smeared out heavy side. Uh, and that also moves the, uh, the, the reference position of the, uh, of, the in, of the interface. So your standard approach is the following. This is your g, the function of x. This is your, your distance. Uh, you can find level sets. that work like this as well. OK, so we'll stick for now to the, um, to the sine distance function approach. And then we'll talk about the conservative level set uh, later. We mentioned already that we want to abide to the uh, weak form, uh, to, to the weak solution of our uh, transport equation. And that's a challenge. Uh, trajectories can cross uh, when you solve a simple a general hyperbolic uh, transport equation, which, by the way, this transport equation is of the, of the general Hamilton-Jacobi kind. So the type of good enough methods that we talked about yesterday for the reinitialization equation are required for the transport equation as well. That's why we ended up using this uh, quick scheme. If you don't do that, what you'll find is that corners can develop in your solutions. And if corners develop and you don't have a way of assessing the local smoothness of your stencil, you'll start forming oscillations and your simulation will blow up. So you know, this is just a heads up. Uh, that means that you need to introduce an upwind bias of some sort. Since our test cases were pretty simple um, for, the, for the level set and even for the uh, little atomization toy problem we'll do later, uh, the, the, the flow is not too complicated. So this uh, upwind bias can be done just with a quick type scheme. But in general, the state of the art is really to rely on fifths of the Wiener for estimating the gradient or, or, in, or estimating the, uh, the, uh, the level set value to be fluxed combined with 
total variation diminishing room gas schemes, uh, typically third order accurate is, is what's used. So this package is your standard uh, non-oscillatory package uh, to solve hyperbolic equations. Most compressible flow solvers based on finite differences, for example, out there use this same package of tools for the same reasons. Okay, we talked about this toolbox already. If you want the normal, you take the gradient, divide by the magnitude of the gradient, and then the uh, curvature is the divergence of that. If you want to know the volume fraction in a cell, or if you want to know the surface area, you end up having to integrate either a numerical heavy side or a numerical delta. Those things, I think we mentioned already, so we don't need to do to talk more about that. Uh, this is just uh, some numerically smeared uh, heavy side or delta functions. There's one little subtlety that we didn't mention. If I smear my heavy side on a length scale that's epsilon and say that epsilon is delta x, then I essentially give up on any hope of achieving mesh convergence. And the reason for that is that my problem changes as I change my mesh resolution. Basically, that means that the way a transi transition from liquid to gas is tied to the mesh size. If I refine the mesh by a factor of two, this transition happens on the twice final length scale. I've just changed the nature of my physical problem. So if my method explicitly uses dx in order to s set uh, uh, length scales, I will not be able to converge. And so this was pointed out by Enquist uh, quite a while ago. And he proposed a, a nice little trick to fix that, uh, even though it doesn't change the overall nature of the problem. But the idea is you don't want to tie the length scale of smearing to the mesh size explicitly, although you can tie it to other quantities, for example, the characteristic local change in volume fract in, um, in, um, in level set. So the change in local distance from the interface is, is something you can use instead. There's other alternatives. For example, you can make this, uh, this uh, uh, smearing thickness not be an, expri an explicit function of delta x, but make it a function of delta x to a certain power less than 1, such that as you refine, you relatively increase a little bit the smearing thickness, such that you can still reintroduce some convergence. Overall, the smearing is not necessarily the most exciting approach, and so the approach we'll use this afternoon will forego all smearing. We'll go to an approach where we say, we want things to remain as sharp as possible. In the meantime, the, you know, know, know that these exist. We talked yesterday afternoon at length about this reinitialization equation uh, done in pseudo time that I indicate here, uh, that I indicate here not as a tau, but as a T star. So we're not going to spend much more time on this. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about yesterday that, that I thought we should add is the fact that using the same approach, you can start doing uh, extension of any quantity that exists either only on one side, so only on one phase, or only at the interface. So imagine I have some information about a quantity that exists only at the surface. Say, for example, the surface temperature that I evaluate only at the surface. Say that I have an algorithm that requires the knowledge of that surface temperature away from my surface, a few cells away from my surface. How do I generate this? Well, the simplest way you can do this is to say that I will simply take anywhere in my domain Say at that cell here, if I want to know something about the surface temperature, I can find the point that is closest to me on the surface and then that point I can take the surface temperature and bring it over and assign it as myself. That's a reasonable approach in order to extend to a neighbor region around the interface my surface uh, information. Well, this 
can be written down as this equation. What we're saying here is that we're extending the quantity such that there is no change in that quantity in the interface normal direction. Okay, so I move outward normally from the interface while keeping the quantity constant. This is what we're doing here. This temperature field is extended outward normally as a constant. The corresponding equation is this. If the quantity is eta, then what I'm, what I'm imposing is that the change of eta, the gradient of eta, dotted with the gradient of n, meaning the normal direction, has to be zero. So we can solve that equation in the same way as we solved the equation above. Uh, the reinitialization equation that we introduced was that equation, magnitude of grad g is equal to 1. Now we're saying that we could be interested in solving that equation, grad of eta dot grad g is equal to 0. Or we can do that in exactly the same way. We will add a time derivative, a sine function to control the, the direction of the characteristics eman eman emanating from the front. And then we just put normal dotted with grad of that function is equal to 0. Once we reach steady state, we should have that the normal dotted with our gradient is 0. How can we calculate the distance, is what you said? Uh, from the interface to some, say, neighbor grade point, if you want to calculate So this information is precisely the distance function. The distance function is, at all points, the information of how far we are from our closest point. So if your question is truly, how do we calculate the distance, the answer is we have it, we're solving for it. If your question is, what is the closest point, well, that's something that requires essentially taking the surface information and extending it, extending, extending it outward from the interface in the normal direction, which you can do by solving that equation. Okay, so so you can discretize that in the same way as we've talked about. Uh, our, so you, know, you can use the same we know type uh, schemes and do the same things uh, that we talked about before. Uh, yesterday afternoon, this will work the same way. You'll be able to extend quantities from the interface out or from one phase into the other phase. This type of stuff becomes very useful, for example, for the, the go-through techniques that we talked about yesterday morning. If you want to create fictitious liquid data inside your gas, well, you can do that by taking your liquid data and extending it according to that equation to the other side of your interface. Okay, so this is all fine and good, but there are problems. And uh, this was kind of the message I was trying to, uh, to, uh, um, to uh, give you uh, tomorrow, uh, yesterday, which is that it moves the interface, this reinitialization moves the interface, and it smooths um, the, the level set field as well as any auxiliary function that you might be interested in extending. So this is not a perfect method. Also, it is pretty costly. Right, if you do a couple of steps of your time integration in order to move information by one cell and you're interested in populating a neighborhood of 20 cells or 10 cells, we're talking about running maybe 30, 40, 50 iterations in pseudo time in order to extend the quantity in the band of interest. Uh, and that's, that's not a small expense. However, it is easy to put in a code. Right? Once you've derived your we know scheme, you can, you know, this is normal PDE methods, you can discretize that, you can parallelize that, well, it will work fine. Okay, so let's fix some of those problems. The first problem that we pointed out was cost. There is a, uh, a very straight, oh, this one is not readable at all. Well, there is a simple uh, solution that uh, is in the, the paying paper that, uh, that I included in your uh, course pack and that I, I cited, I think, uh, uh, two days ago. In this PANG paper, the concept of a narrow band is introduced. The point is the following. The only thing we care about in this flow, uh, in this uh, level set, is the position of the interface. The interface is the G is equal to zero isosurface. So the only thing we care about, really, is that line here. 
how do I find that line? Well, it's not particularly complicated. If I have a g sub i here and a g sub i plus 1 here, if the product of the two is negative, I know that my g has flipped sign and I've crossed between point i and point i plus 1. I know that I have crossed the interface. Okay, so localizing the interface then can be done through a simple linear interpolation. So that means that if the only thing you care about is g is equal to zero, well, you clearly need to know about the point right below zero and the point right above zero. So you need those two guys for sure. Then do you need this guy? Well, okay, uh, we're doing we know schemes. Uh, so we have, you know, we need a few cells in our neighborhood to be able to transport. So yeah, yeah, we need, we need this guy. Do we need this guy? Yeah, well, so if we do we know three, we need two points on each side. So to transport that guy accurately, I need that point and that point. But do I need that guy? Well, okay, let's say we do we know five. So yes, I need that guy. But do I need that guy over there? Well, now it's starting to get more doubtful. Really, I don't. If I have three points on each side of the point closest to the interface, I, both positive and negative, I should be able to do one step of transport confidently. Anything else is overkill. Hence the idea of using a band approach. If you solve your equation in a narrow band of a few cells on the other five cells on each side of the interface, you should have everything you need. Now, how do you know whether you're in the band of five cells around the interface? Well, you have a distance. You're solving for a distance. So you know precisely how far you are from the interface in the first place. So this is not difficult to construct. It's more of a, of a, of a uh, very simple mechanics that you have to deploy. So you need to know where the interface is defined. You need to know where, what the interface, uh, the, what the level set value is in the neighborhood region to build your Wino stencil. You need G in the region around your interface as well in order to compute your uh, uh, smeared out uh, heavy sides and deltas and compute the curvature. And you need also another Wino stencil to be able to do your initialization. But th that means that you need essentially to know something about the level set in a band of maybe five cells, maybe up to 10 cells on each side of the interface. So that's what uh, Pang proposed. The way he did that is he said, well, let's solve our transport equation provided that our local value of the level set is not too high and an absolute value. If it's too high, we're too far from the interface, and who cares anyway? So he gives up essentially on transport. The way he does that is by introducing this coefficient here that allows him to go from, so this coefficient goes, well, so this is what's written here in the most blurry way possible. But this coefficient tells you that if g is small, then you're going to solve the full transport equation. If g is large, this equation goes to zero. In between, you transition from one to zero. So that turns off the transport in regions where you don't care about transport. There's two ways to think about this. One way is to think about this as a way to reduce the amount of uh, uh, um, difficulties with boundary conditions and things like that, but really, from the cost perspective, this can be very useful. So that tells you that if your G value is high enough, you do not need to solve the transport equation. Either you're a little lazy and you still loop over the entire domain and you just check your local value and if it's too high, you just don't solve. Or uh, you're willing to invest a bit more and you create a, an unstructured set of nodes where that you can traverse directly uh, where the level set is, value is close enough from zero. And you only go to those nodes and solve the equation only there. So that can truly compress the amount of work you're doing. So that's for the transport. Then you have another issue, which is that you need to reinitialize a bit further than the transport. If you need to be able to say when to stop the transport, you need to know that the cell right outside the transport band is far enough away to not be in the transport band. So that assumes that you reinitialize a little bit further outside than the transport band. So you'll transport in the region of maybe five, six cells. You reinitialize in the region that's maybe seven, eight cells. Then after you've done that, you'll clip everything that's 
uh, that is uh, outside your band, you'll clean it up, and then you update your band, and you go again. How does that work? Imagine I have only a band in which I've defined my level set. Okay, interface right here at zero. Uh, again, apologies about the, the, the low resolution. So only a, 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 a small band here where I have defined my level set. I simply give up entirely on having anything of meaning on the left and on the right. I'll do, so if I transport that, ideally what I want is for this front to move. Okay, that's what I want. The way the, the, the toolkit we're talking about is gonna work is that it's gonna do your Wiener transport, but we're gonna turn off transport as we get to the edge of the band. So really we're only transporting accurately the middle, the middle region of this little uh, level set segment. The edges slacking behind, they're gonna be they're going to be deformed and they're not going to follow the exact solution because we're not, we don't have all the data here to do what we need to do. So only the middle region is going to be correct. But then we're going to come in and radially outward, uh, or normally outward from the center, we're going to re-extend uh, our distance function. We're going to regenerate our distance function. So now, from the middle, we'll push out and recreate the distance. And we can do that over our entire band. And now anything that overshoots or undershoots what we consider to be a sufficiently large band will clip off, and there you go, we've transported our, our information. So this reduces the cost dramatically because, yes, okay, we're doing maybe 20 sub iterations uh, of a, in, in, uh, in, um, in pseudo time of a, a different equation, a reinitialization equation. So the cost has increased compared to simple transport, we've gone up in cost by maybe a factor of 20 because we're solving this extra equation. But now we've truly limited the region over which we solve that equation to a small band. So now we're truly really solving more of a surface problem in the full 3D volume uh, 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 over which we're doing our CFD. So we've, uh, we've collapsed the dimensionality of this problem by one, which is a significant cost saving. Make sense? Any questions on this? Okay. I have uh, and in, in this topic, let me see, yeah, so I have just one more tool that I want to talk about that I did not have a uh, chance to talk about in the afternoon uh, sessions. So we'll explain that last tool, uh, and then we'll talk a bit about, we'll summarize this, and then we'll generalize to a few other methods and we'll be essentially done with an um, overview of, uh, of methods. Let me check the time. That should be good. Ultimately, what makes the reinitialization equation frustrating is the fact that it needs to be integrated to close to steady state, so ideally to steady state in pseudo time. The fact that we have this full time dependent problem to solve on the side at each time step, that's a big, big uh, um, overhead. There's a lot of value in trying to avoid this extra time dependent problem. The simplest way to do this is to move away from this iterative nature and simply go after the solution of, this, of the uh, stationary solution. So what if we were to remove the time dependency of our problem? Well, then the equation we're solving is directly this. Right? This is effectively the steady state of our initialization equation. So how do we solve this directly? So first of all, this has a, a nice name if you're interested. Um, this is what's called a, a static Iconel equation. So some non-trivial relation between the derivatives of a function uh, without the time derivative, that's a static Iconel equation. So our general Hamilton uh, Jacobi equation well, we don't care about it too much. We don't care about it too much. We care about its steady state. Can we go after the steady state solution directly? Well, we know already because we've gone through the process of discretizing this uh, time dependent equation, how we should discretize the gradient of G in a way that's stable. We, you know, we know about the concept of a good enough gradient. So why not use directly this expression that we wrote last time, you know, coming from Sussman, for the gradient and set it equal to one. What can we do with this? Well, the issue, so imagine that to compute this, if I limit the, uh, the accuracy of my differentiations, uh, 
this will use my central point, IJ, the neighbor to the right, the neighbor to the left, the neighbor above, the neighbor below, five points. If four of those points are known already, then I can use this directly in order to obtain the fifth one. This is the only condition under which I can get an answer. Well, I'm oversimplifying things a little bit because those max of the plus and minus derivatives mean that my stencil will typically be one-sided. Okay, I'll be using always the smoothest representation. So I'll be either using information to the left or to the right, above or below. But still, the answer is the same. If the points I'm using have, uh, are known already, then I can use that relation directly to solve for my own value. Well, this we could do, provided we had a process by which we can guarantee that we always know our neighbors are right. They're done. They have the final value of the, of the distance. So let's put together a scheme that does this. The process is going to start as follows. So first of all, we're going to need three tags. We're going to take all of our grid points, and we're going to say that they're either far from the interface or close to the interface or accepted. Accepted is going to mean that those are data points where the value of the distance is final. It has reached its it, it's uh, it's uh, um, the solution uh, compatible th with that relation. Okay. So every point that is accepted, we're done with it, and we know the g value. Any neighbor to an accepted point will tag it as being close. All right. Every point, L, every other point in our domain will be far. First, let's talk about how we can get some accepted points in this, uh, in this uh, story. So we need to start the process somehow. Well, that's not too difficult, provided you're willing to not be excessively accurate. Um, the idea is the following. If you're a point, so again, it takes us back to exactly the same idea here. If you're sitting at point i, and the product of your level set value to the neighbor's level set value is negative, you know that you're sitting right against the interface. Then the question becomes, what is my distance from that interface? Well, you know that, and that's your own distance. But you can also do the same test with the neighbor above and find that there's another interface up there. And there might be another interface on the left and potentially another interface below. So you can look at all this and categorize that in tests that are fairly straightforward in the end and then decide geometrical rules by which you, you measure your distance. If you have only one intersection with the interface, well, you can set your distance as the distance to that intersection. If you have multiple intersections, well, you can put that in a quadratic equation like this to find your distance to the interface. If you have now three intersections, you can, try, you can use that same rule and try it out on both sides and see which one gives you the smallest distance. If you have two distances, but they're each of them on, on, uh, on, on the uh, opposite uh, direction in the same uh, orientation, so both of them say in y, one in minus y, the other one in plus y, then your distance is just the smallest distance uh, to both intersections. And you can keep on building that up, and you can do that in 3D. It's a little painful, but it's not complicated. It's not particularly accurate. This is a first, order, a first order accurate estimate of your distance. But it's a way to get the process started. So from the local information of the distance, you can say, I know for sure, based on the local geometry, this is how far my interface is. Or at least this is my estimate of how far the interface is. And then from all those points that are sitting right at the interface, you're going to say, OK, all of these, I'm going to say, I can't get anything better than this. And so you're going to accept them all. That's going to be the way you're going to initialize the process. By the way, like I said, this is not perfect. This will induce some motion of the interface. You can improve that. Uh, CHOP in uh, 2001, I believe, uh, introduced a, uh, an improvement to this by, look, by doing local uh, B-spline reconstructions of the interface and then projecting your own point to this interface and minimizing your distance. Yeah, I mean, that works, but every time you start going high order, the interface shape can become pretty crazy, and this, the stability of that in 3D can be problematic. 
but that exists. So this gives us a process to initialize this entire exercise. So now we know the distance for a set of accepted points. So now we're going to make use of, so first of all, we're going to say that every point that has a neighbor that's accepted, we're going to say it's close. Close will mean it's a potential uh, point where we should be solving our equation because we might be in a position to say something about the distance. This is where we're going to use our good enough uh, gradient. We're going to use our discretized form of the local good enough gradient that we defined yesterday afternoon. And we're going to use that directly in order to solve the local value. Well, every place where we, s where we use an accepted node will have the level set value there, so we're fine. We can make use of this. Every place where we don't have an accepted node, we're going to just set a value crazy enough to our level set such that we ensure that our good enough gradient doesn't use this local value. So we're going to set an infinity value for the level set in all the nodes that have not been accepted yet, and we'll crunch our good enough relation to get the local uh, level set uh, estimate. What this will give us is an answer as to what our distance is for all those, uh, those green uh, closed nodes. The issue is that if I go back here, yes, I will get an answer as to what the distance of that guy to the interface is. Yes, I will get some answer. But it is likely that I would be able to get a more accurate answer if I knew already what the distance of that guy is to the interface. But I don't know that yet, uh, because this guy is not accepted, it is close. So there's no reason for me to trust the answer I'm going to get at that location. But now this guy, well, maybe I have a good reason to trust the answer I get here, because it already has a neighborhood of two points that tell something about the distance. So basically, you don't now know for sure whether the value you're getting is correct or not. The way you're going to resolve this is using the following trick. You're going to sort your distances. So that's a pretty painful step. So you're going to take all your close values, a whole lot of distances, and you're going to say, let's see what is the closest distance to the farthest distance. And what you're going to say is, well, the closest distance, if I adhere to this idea that the characteristics uh, associated with my econal equations are, or my Hamilton-Jacobi equation are radiating outward from the interface, basically the information comes from the points closest than me to the interface, then my good enough gradient, if it's properly written, should never be using a, a, a distance value that's larger than myself. So that means the one value of a, uh, of a close node that is acceptable is the value of the closest of all the closed nodes. Because that's the one where I know that it cannot possibly need to rely on any neighbors, uh, any other closed node neighbor information. So uh, out of all the calculations, I'll sort them all and I'll take the closest point and I'll say, as far as I know, this point has to be accepted as well because it cannot possibly else. So for this point, you're done. You take this guy and you tag it as accepted. And now you move forward. You have one more accepted point. You can locally around in this region add its neighbors as uh, now closed points. And you can update their, um, their uh, level set values from the, 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 the same um, iconal equation. And you can resort and you can go again and again and again. So you iterate on this until you've sorted out all your points and until you've accepted all your points, and then you're done. Uh, why do we heap sort? We heap sort because it is very practical to add a new piece of information in a heap sort and resort the heap. It's a, uh, the heap. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a much shorter exercise than if you were to do any type of other sort. The heap sort allows you to insert and, 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 and update efficiently, while a quick sort will be, have to be redone. So there's a, this is a practical uh, uh, scheme for our purpose. OK, does that make sense? You see how this can work? So this is an iterative scheme, 
where each iteration involves only updating very few points and accepting them as you go. Uh, so you basically unroll this pretty rapidly. Uh, in the same, a uh, very same uh, algorithm can be used to do the same extension of data from the in interface outwards. You can do the same exact scheme to solve this other iconal equation. So, the good thing about that is that it removes the time dependency. You do this fast marching algorithm, you directly get your answer to uh, the, the, the static answer to this Hamilton-Jacobi equation. The other good thing is that because you're doing this on the fly heap sort and all this, the costs ends up being pretty limited. That's why it's called a fast marching method. It is an n log n algorithm. It's not linear, but it's not too bad. So it's still very much usable. Combined with a band approach, provided you only care about a small region, this ends up being pretty cheap. The very bad thing about that algorithm, well, there's really two bad things. The first bad thing is that it moves the interface. It's not free of diffusion. It, is, uh, it, it has numerical diffusion because this uh, good enough gradient is, is not a very high accuracy gradient. Uh, this is a scheme that's very difficult to extend to high order accuracy. Extremely difficult because that involves sorting many more points. And also it's a scheme that's a pain to parallelize. Okay, so imagine now we're dealing with the sorting of our points. What if those points are distributed over multiple processors? Uh, there's one solution that is not satisfactory, that is to bring all the points locally to one processor and do the work there. But that's not a truly parallelized algorithm. So really the only solution, at least uh, I have seen and the, the one I use, is you do a fast marching on each processor almost independently. Each of them work on their own sorting and they figure out their own thing. And then regularly you check the neighbor's information and you fix your process. Right, so you work independently and once in a while you go back and correct. You, you figure out that your sorting was wrong because of the neighbor and you just admit your error and you roll back, you go back in time and you resort and you, and you, you restart the process. So that's unfortunate, that makes it very unwieldy in parallel but it's still doable. Questions on this? Okay, so once you have this algorithm, there's cool things you can do with it. In particular, you can go back to your transport equation and you can rewrite it in a slightly different way. So remember, we saw dgdt plus u dot grad g is equal to zero. Well, n is equal to grad g of a magnitude of grad g. That means that really my equation is dg dt plus u dot n times magnitude of grad g is equal to zero. This is really my, my transport equation. This is defined and constrained by the fluid velocity at the interface. Away from the interface, I'm free to choose any type of transport velocity that I want. I'm, I'm free to do anything I want because my, the meaning of my level set transport equation is uh, essentially disappears as soon as I'm not at the interface anymore. So in particular, you can observe that if the gradient, so here what I did is I, rewrite, I rewrote this uh, uh, transport velocity, this u dot n, this scalar quantity, I rewrote it as, uh, as an fx, and I'll explain the x in a second. If this fx is made to be equal to u dot n, I included here the evaporation velocity if you have one, but if it is equal to u dot n at the interface, that's fine, you're going to be accurate. But you're free to make it different to u dot n away from the interface. And in particular, it might make a lot of sense to strive away from the interface for the gradient of that uh, fx to be um, parallel to, uh, to be perpendicular to the gradient of g. If you do that, you can take the gradient of that equation and looks at what is the transport equation for the gradient of g. And you'll see that because of that condition, so if this holds, that implies that d of the magnitude of the gradient of g dt is equal to zero. That means that if this property holds, then you will never be able to change the magnitude of the gradient of your level set by transport. Which means that if you start from a distance function, you will stay at a distance function. Okay? 
So manipulating the transport velocity such that it doesn't vary normally to the interface will force a distance function to remain a distance function at all times. What is this? Well, this is this extensional iconal equation that we wrote on the previous page. If I take u dot n at the interface and I extend this outward from the interface and I use this quantity to transport my level set, I should never need to reinitialize ever again. This idea is an interesting idea uh, that is referred to as the idea of an extension velocity. The approach we're going to use is the following. We're going to use a fast marching algorithm that solves for that equation. And at the same time, we're going to use it to solve gradient of f extension dot gradient of g is equal to 0. But we will not use the fast marching result of the realized g. We'll discard that. The only thing we'll care about is this extension velocity fx. And we'll use this in our transport equation up here. If we do that, we should never need to reinitialize. So we only use this for transport. That method on paper removes the need to ever reinitialize. In practice, it doesn't quite work like that. There's numerical errors. So even though we, ha we stick to essentially a distance function, this is a, an increasingly erroneous distance function as time goes by. And we end up with, uh, with still needing to reinitialize every once in a while. So every 100 steps, maybe, or something like that, you would actually make use of this function. Make use of, uh, uh, so. <coughs> using the fast marching uh, function. Does it make sense? Everyone sees how if, uh, if you extend the velocity radially outward uh, as a constant, then you, you, you don't deform anymore. And you just take the gradient uh, of that equation, magnitude of the gradient of that, of that equation, and you'll find directly zero because of that property. OK. Some, uh, some performance of, uh, of the method. We played with this already. Uh, we played with a quick implementation combined with a uh, Wino 3 forward Euler reinitialization equation. The results were not as symmetric as this on a 100 by 100 mesh, but not as diffusive as, as this. This is a fifth order Wino transport. Fifth order Wino will end up being more diffusive with, uh, for transport than a third order quick. And that explains why this notch has been reduced more compared to what we saw together. But those are accurate methods. So if you continue refining the mesh, you get very, very good results very rapidly. So this is a method uh, uh, that has some very good capability uh, for sure. This is our stretching problem. Uh, we looked at it already. I don't know if we need to spend much more time on that. Uh, you saw this already. So. It works, but it loses the end of the, uh, of the ligaments because of lack of resolution. We've talked about that already. I'm not going to spend uh, much time resetting the fluid properties, uh, computing the heavy side, uh, how to estimate the surface tension. Well, you can estimate the surface tension still using the continuum surface force uh, by using a numerical delta. And we've talked about how to write that numerical delta. Um, and you can compute the curvature by taking a, a simple central difference approximation uh, of the divergence of the normal. In the normal, we've talked about how, it, uh, how to get. So this is one approach. Uh, I will say, I'll add to this, can use the so-called ghost fluid method. And we'll see that this afternoon. OK. Uh, 
let me skip this and go directly to um, the uh, overview of the, 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 the process. One comment, so phase change is probably the easiest to handle with a level set method because now normal motion of the interface is just one more term in your transport equation. There's no uh, difficulty here. Topology changes are done automatically in the same way as for the VOF because of the inherent grid-based uh, support for the, for, the, uh, uh, for the function. Again, the breakup, merging, distortion at, uh, under topology change events is happening on the scale of delta x. One important thing is the fact that volume or slash mass or area in 2D is not going to be conserved. There's nothing inherently conservative that when you transport a distance. I'll show you an example of this. Imagine, so uh, ignore the, uh, uh, just look at the underlying Cartesian grid. Imagine this is my level set. If I'm looking at the thin structure that could come from our stretching of our, of our ligament uh, problem, I have this, this very thin region where the support for this ligament takes place on a single node. Okay? I have a single cell here that contains um, a, uh, the, the specific sign of this interface uh, of this level set, say positive in the middle here. So one positive surrounded by two negative values. If I transport this down by half a cell, suddenly this liquid bridge is now going to completely fit in between grid nodes. And so I'll go from negative, 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 and I'll jump directly to still negative, 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 negative level set values. So effectively, according to this test of g sub i times g sub i plus 1 being negative, I don't have an interface anymore. That's how topology changes occur. This chunk of stuff has just disappeared, literally disappeared. So now I've lost this. As a result, my topology has changed. Okay, I've broken my, my ligament. But also, everything that was in there, this, uh, this region here, it's gone. It's disappeared completely from our representation. So that's a, a good way of, of understanding uh, that, uh, uh, of at least visualizing that the method is not conservative in any way. So if this is rare, this is fine. If you're looking at atomization, this is not rare. This is what happens all the time. It becomes very detrimental to the solution. Okay. So the good thing about level set is that it is like VOF, an implicit representation of the interface geometry. But unlike VOF, you don't ever need to worry about rebuilding the interface uh, um, reconstructing the interface geometry explicitly. Few overall comments here. It is very easy overall, except for the fast marching method, to derive, to use pretty classical schemes like uh, uh, RK3 combined with Wino schemes, those type of packages. You know, they are pretty common packages of, uh, of algorithms. You can use them easily, implement, parallelize pretty, pretty easily. Uh, but it is not inherently volume conserving. And so either you have to kill the problem with resolution, and so that um, is the idea of the so-called refined. Level set grid approach of Marcus Herman at Arizona State University, where the idea is to introduce an auxiliary, extremely fine grid in order to deal with the level set. Uh, or alternatively, you have to rely on some alternative method, uh, some hybridized method that will fix those issues. Curvature tends to be good, uh, but when you have two fronts coming close to one another, it becomes more problematic. OK. Uh, well, so. Let me use just, um, so in terms of hybrid methods to kind of wrap this up, th there's quite a few of them. I'm not going to go through the details of, uh, of, of many of them, um, but there's a so-called particle level set method that I'll mention briefly from Enright and, uh, and uh, I can't remember his name, uh, Fertiger, uh, back in 2002. Uh, this particle level set method will reintroduce 
some Lagrangian aspect to the transport to address some of those conservation errors. Van der Pilge uh, in 2005 introduced what is really a hybrid between level sets and VOF, where the transport is done from the, the perspective of the volume under the zero isosurface of the level set. That's, that's a method that uh, allows to fix the conservation errors. Different reinitialization algorithms were developed, and there's a number of other references. Uh, uh, different algorithms for reinitialization have been developed that mitigate uh, conservation errors, that try to move the interface to make sure that the volume doesn't change. And then you have uh, methods that more, uh, more explicitly try to bridge the gap between level set and VOF. One of them, which is probably the most popular method, uh, the, the, the most individual, uh, popular individual method, is the so-called coupled level set VOF method. Coupled level set VOF is a method of uh, Mark Sussman uh, from a while ago that's still used very, very uh, often. This method has some interesting properties, but it is essentially a VAF method. It's essentially a VAF method that recognizes that it is difficult to obtain a normal vector accurately, but that if you were to transport a level set at the same time as you transport your VAF, well, it is pretty easy to get a normal vector from the level set. So the idea of the uh, couple level set VAF is essentially to say, let us recreate a level set that's compatible with the VAF field. We'll transport both the VAF geometrically and the level set using standard level set methods. And at the end of our time step, we'll use the level set to give us information about the orientation of the interface, which the level set is very good at doing. Just take the gradient of the level set, normalize it, and that's your normal. And then we're going to use that to perform our PLIC and, and to continue our VAF algorithm. And then the conservative level set uh, method, uh, this comes from uh, Olson. I think there's two S's, Olson and Kreis. Uh, I think 05. The idea here is to say, well, if our level set didn't look like a distance function, but instead it looked like a pretty sharp hyperbolic tangent function, it would be almost like a heavy side. It would be almost like a VOF field. Well, what if we conserve that function that looks almost like a VOF field? Well, then it's still a level set method, but it can achieve uh, a conservation close to, uh, with a performance close to that of a, uh, of a VOF scheme. So I think I have a couple more slides, but I don't think we'll spend too much more time on this. I'll just show you. Uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the performance of two examples here, the particle level set method and the mass conserving level set method. The particle level set method, I have the full algorithm here, but the idea is just that we're going to put particles on each side of the interface, and we're going to give a size to those particles. And that size is going to be the distance between the particle center and the interface. So we're going to represent our interface with a collection of overlapping particles. If I have enough of them, you can see here that that collection of little spheres ends up approximating reasonably a flat surface. So provided you have lots and lots of those particles, you should be able to have some decent representation of where the interface lies. Those particles are close to the interface. You're going to transport them at the, velocity, uh, the same velocity as the interface. And, uh, and you're going to use those particles to correct your level set when it's wrong. So you transport your level set, your level set will incur numerical errors, diffusion errors, your corners are going to be rounded, the particles are not going to feel those errors. They're going to remain where they need to be, where they need to be at the corner. And so with the non-trivial, uh, there you go, with, with uh, um, a number of uh, non-trivial algorithmic steps, you're going to have your particles on one side, blue and the other side, red, they all have a size and they all estimate for you where the interface is. Your level set transport 
might predict that your tail here extends only up to that region. But your particles tell you, no, 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 I'm telling you, I'm, I'm still in the liquid. I'm still within, you know, I'm still inside this uh, stretched disk. Now, in that situation, where it seems that particles have crossed the interface, which is kinematically impossible because of a divergence-free velocity field, um, in those regions, you're going to say, well, I'm going to trust the particles. And so you're going to go and redraw your level set around the particles. Okay? The idea is not very complicated. The issue is that in any method where you manage a population of particles, uh, you have to guarantee that those particles remain uniformly distributed. You, they have to sample the problem in a way that's, uh, that's uh, accurate. And for that, you don't need too many particles. You shouldn't have too few particles. So you need to actively work to readjust your particles all the time. So there's a lot of work. And so those steps that I'm, uh, that I'm skipping here. It's, it's a method that works. It's not a method that's very easy to, uh, to, to deploy. It's beautiful for a level set test case uh, 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 for our ZZAC disk rotation. It gives you a seemingly perfect result. Why? Because this is a linear flow problem. The, uh, the advection of the particles is pretty much exact. Okay, and this is the last example of the mass conserving uh, level set uh, problem where the idea is to create a connection between a volume fraction so the, the, the work of van der Pilge was to use stereo series uh, expansions to estimate accurately the volume fraction under the zero iso surface of an interface uh, of a level set defined using G and its gradient. G and its gradient defines a plane. From that, I can integrate the volume under that plane, click style, if you will. Uh, and so once you can freely move from a level set back to a sharp volume fraction, you can also transport this volume fraction using a VOF style idea. Once you transport this using a VOF style idea, you know at the end of your, of your time step how much liquid volume you absolutely need to have for conservation to be valid in your cell. And you've also received your level set from the transport of the level set using your Wiener scheme. And now you can use one to correct the other. And so that allows you to get you, know, you still have the numerical diffusion, the rounded corners uh, uh, in, in your Zalizak problem uh, due to the uh, numerical diffusion in your transport, but this notch that was, that was uh, being eaten up by mass conservation errors, now it is not eaten, eaten up anymore, it just deforms a bit, but the volume is exactly conserved. So I won't go into more details, uh, and the next few slides will, will cover that as part of what we're going to talk about tomorrow morning. So I'll stop here. I'm happy to take any questions. And again, this afternoon, we'll introduce the ghost root method. Uh, we'll derive everything behind it. Uh, we'll put it in place in the code, and then we'll run. Uh, we'll play with, with droplets and bubbles. We'll play with things that respond to surface tension. Thank you for your attention.